It is uh, great to see so many of our current students, current faculty, former students, former faculty here. I think uh, that's what makes this a very special occasion for all of us. Um, I think what uh, Chris has done today in instituting a distinguished chair in the name of um, uh, a teacher of his time is something that uh, we are all extremely proud of. And this is also the first time that a chair has been endowed with such an amount. Uh, the rupees 10 crore endowment makes this a very special chair. I mean, not so much for the amount, which is obviously great, but also for the fact that it gives us the ability to, to bring in visiting professors to occupy this chair, where we are able to compensate them uh, on a global scale. So essentially, the, the salary is not going to be an impediment to us getting the best people to occupy this chair. Um, I think that, uh, as we can see from the people that have actually come today, this is a, a function, an event that really binds together these various constituencies, the, the faculty, the students, and I think that's what really makes this occasion very special. It's great to see so many of our faculty stalwarts back on campus and, of course, our esteemed alumni who are here quite frequently these days, but uh, we can always uh, see more of you. We'll be happy to. Um, the other reason I think uh, this uh, occasion is very special is because uh, the, um, it's, a, it's a special day for our office. Uh, the Dean's Office for International and Alumni Relations was created about two years ago, and the objective was to actually leverage the fact that our alumni relations and our international relations are quite uh, inextricably bound together. This is a perfect illustration of that. When Chris made his announcement early this year about uh, instituting these chairs at uh, IIT Madras, IISC, CMU, uh, the postdocs at CMU, um, obviously we knew that we had a challenge ahead of us because there's no really, there's not much point in uh, having a chair if you're not able to fill it. So we immediately started working on that to identify qualified people who could occupy the chair and give it the stature that it deserved. And here, we were able to really leverage our alumni network to a great extent. Our alumni uh, who are faculty in various universities, alumni in industry, so we talked to many of them. I personally visited several of them. And we were able to develop a short list of about 15 to 20 people who we thought would be perfect for this chair. And, and then we started talking to these people, and finally, we were able to arrive at a truly outstanding candidate as the first occupant of the Professor Mahabala Distinguished Chair in Computational Brain Research. Dr. Partha Mitra from Cold Spring Harbor Lab is that individual. And at the end of the program, we will be playing a, a videotaped message from him. Um, so with that, I again want to welcome all of you. And I will now request our director, Professor Bhaskar Ramurthy, to say a few words. Thank you, Nagarajan, and uh, it's a very special welcome to Professor Mahabala and, of course, to our Chris Gopalakrishnan. He is uh, currently on our Board of Governors. We just finished our board meeting. He is also on the board of the research park. We had that in the morning. So he is uh, pretty much at work here quite a lot. This is a very, uh, as Nagarajan said, a very uh, special occasion. Because uh, not only are we uh, announcing and creating a, a very special chair uh, with a very hefty endowment and with, uh, with the wherewithal to actually bring in uh, people who can, who can make a huge difference, but it also is, a, is a, the beginning of, an, of uh, an initiative to create new areas of research new areas where we are not yet active, such as computational brain research, in an accelerated fashion. Normally, how would this happen? You would wait for some young faculty member who is in this area, some young researcher who wants to join academics, who then wants to come to IIT Madras for some reason and applies here and then joins the de particular department that is relevant, sets up a small group, you know, he's a he or she, 
slowly build up their capabilities, you know, attract some funding, build up their equipment, research, lab, everything, get students, takes time. In this kind of an approach, where we'll still have to do the same thing, we'll have to get uh, young faculty in, to join our uh, departments in this area, build a group. But what somebody, uh, you know, people like uh, Professor Mitra, who's going to be the first occupant, the occupants of chairs like the Mahabala, Professor Mahabala chair and the few, one or two more that will be coming up, they, what they do is to become a nucleus around which all of this can happen much faster. So we will, not only will they spend some time of their, their own time, uh, you know, uh, uh, initiating research and uh, giving courses and so on. More importantly, they will, they'll help, we, with their help, we will create the group here, recruit faculty, recruit postdocs. Their own, they will train by, uh, in, in the labs of these people. Plus, they will be integrated into the global community because these global communities in these emerging areas are not very large. There are several groups across the world who will be working in that. You need to integrate with them so that you can move along as fast as they are moving along. So this is really what it does. With this, we are doing this also in the last one year. Uh, the same thing is happening in another area in the biotechnology department uh, where uh, Dr. Ashok Venkatraman from Cambridge is attempting a similar effort in another area. And this is a model that I think is, uh, is very, uh, uh, looks to be, I mean, we have not, I can't say it's a success yet because we just started these, but looks to be a way of, uh, a reasonably sensible way of accelerating uh, programs, creating programs rapidly in new and emerging areas. And we are very grateful that uh, these leading uh, researchers, leading uh, scientists in these areas are willing to, uh, to uh, give off their time and energy to help us create these centers in our own institute. And, uh, in t and of course, the such, such accelerated efforts, such uh, one-off efforts need their own special funding. And that's where the generosity of somebody and the vision of somebody like Chris comes into the picture. Of course, he's created a big center, Brain Research Center in Bangalore, where the necessary infrastructure for imaging and other things will, uh, is being put in place. The, the idea is that some of these faculty who are working in the allied area of computational brain research and so on, if they need uh, access to those kinds of facilities, then they can act, they can leverage them, leverage them right there in Bangalore. So that's also being created in parallel. But th that center will, of course, primarily study problems associated with the brain, such as aging, Alzheimer's, and so on. At the chairs at IIT and at IIC, the, the work that will be undertaken is in allied areas, such as neuromorphic computing, computational brain research, and in helping us create this kind of uh, entry into new and cutting edge areas rapidly and quickly. This kind of an endowment, this kind of a chair, I think, is probably the uh, uh, you know a key to getting the solution. So we're very very grateful to Chris for his vision and for his generosity, and uh, I'm very pleased that uh, within a short time of a few months, we were able to uh, do the homework necessary to not only now launch the chair today, but actually to uh, uh, introduce you to its first occupant. Thank you all very much for coming today. Thank you all for, me, uh, for uh, accepting our invitation. I wish you all the best. I hope the function is, uh, is uh, great success. I'm very grateful to all our former teachers who have come here today. Uh, it shows their lasting uh, connection with the Institute, the affection they have for us. Uh, personally for me, uh, this is an important day because when I came here and joined as a visiting faculty member in 1986, it was Professor Mahabala who gave the appointment. Thank you very much. Um, I will now request uh, Chris to hand over a ceremonial check to Professor Bhaskar. First, take the check. <laughs> <laughs> you already taken the check. <laughs> and I will now invite Chris to address the gallery. Thank you and good evening to everyone. Um, let me start to, with a story. and. Uh, I think Professor Mahabala heard it for the first time uh, on, at my retirement. Uh, um, but many of you probably um, do not uh, know this. Um, uh, of course, I did my MSc Physics and MTech Computer Science here between 75 and 79. 75 to 77 MSc Physics and 77 to 79 MTech Computer Science. Um, and um, and 
I was, um, of course, staying in the hostel and uh, one afternoon I was going from the library back to the hostel. This was while I was doing MSc Physics. And um, uh, at the, in those days um, I had a cycle, a bicycle, and I was riding the bicycle and going to the hostel. And uh, suddenly somebody behind me in a cycle comes and says, stop. And uh, I stop. This person uh, says, okay, what books are you reading? And uh, of course, the, those were one or two books on computers, actually. And I said, uh, I'm interested in computers and uh, reading a couple of books on computers. Uh, the person said, uh, there is a Fortran course in the campus. Why don't you uh, go and join this? These are off credit. Uh, these are not part of the regular uh, curriculum. Uh, take the course. Uh, of course, I took the course, uh, got interested in computer science, and uh, got admission to computer science. And the person was none other than Professor Mahabala. He was the head of department of computer science at that point, and um, definitely that did change my life uh, because I got interested in computer science, got access to the second largest mainframe system in Asia. So we had access to some of the largest computers, latest technology way back then. And, and many of us benefited. Of, of course, Professor Mahabala is one of the people who taught computer science to lots and lots of the people uh, in, in this room and um, many of the senior uh, leadership in the industry today have benefited from um, uh, Professor Mahabala, his classes, etc. And he has taught till recently at Triple ITB, very recently at Triple ITB. So he has continued teaching generations of um, students. Uh, and that's the main reason why I decided that when, um, when this chair is going to be set up, that it will be set up in the name of Professor Mahabala. In my way of uh, saying thank you to <laughs> Professor Mahabala and to teachers in general. There are a couple of other stories uh, which are very interesting. Luck has played a very big role in my life, actually. Uh, after my, I did my B.Sc. Physics from Trivandrum, uh, I wrote the entrance examination for IIM Ahmedabad. Those were not the days when you had a combined uh, exam for um, all the institutes. So you have to write separate exam. I wrote for IIM Ahmedabad, got through the test. I wrote for IIT Madras, got through the test. IIT Ahmedabad, IIM Ahmedabad had an interview. Bef so, um, so test and interview. And of course in the interview I couldn't speak very good English. Being from uh, Trivandrum, you know, we speak Malayalam and English is looked down upon in those days, especially in colleges and schools. And so I could not pass through. Luckily, IIT Madras decided no interview. <laughs> so if there was an interview, probably I may not have got selected. Um, and very interestingly, ours was the first batch of MSc students who got admitted to a postgraduate program in engineering. We were the first batch who got admitted. They decided to admit physics and mathematics for an MTech in computer science because this program here was software uh, based and so they decided that um, MSc physics and MTech, you know, MSc physics and MSc math students will be admitted. I don't know whether they are admitted today but in those days they said uh, they will be admitted. In fact, till the end of the first semester we were not sure whether we could continue or not. I think the Senate was yet to approve or something like that in those days. I don't remember now what it was but we didn't get the scholarship. MTech students get scholarship. We didn't get the scholarship till the end of the first semester. And, um, you know, it was a tense uh, first semester, but luckily it got uh, through and we were the first batch of uh, MSc students admitted to MTech actually. So, you know, many, many um, uh, reasons to, you know, be thankful to IIT Madras. Uh, it, it really, really um, changed my life.
when I decided um, to support research, um, I looked at you know what are the areas that are important. Um, clearly, I need some connection with computers because that's the area that I'm interested in. And something that is new, something that is going to uh, benefit everyone, benefit India in the future. And I picked brain because of two reasons. One, I strongly believe that the advances in computing in the future will have significant influence from our understanding of the brain. Um, because, you know, some of the, some of the challenging problems that we are faced with require us to come out with newer models of computing. So for example, if you extrapolate the current model of computing and want to recreate the same power as the brain, you would require 300 megawatts of power. So the limiting factor would be the kind of power that you would, you would require. If you look at the c amount of information that's generated um, and look at um, how we would benefit from that information, again, you need to look at new models of computing, new models of uh, how problems and how answers would be found. Problems would be solved and answers would be found because um, with our current um, algorithms and things like that, if you know what question to ask, you can get the answer because you can write an algorithm and then you can get the answer. You can analyze the data. But if you don't know what question to ask, it's quite, quite challenging to understand what that information tells us actually. What does it contain? Um, again, understanding the brain because how we infer is very different from how we program a computer and get information out of that computer. Third, if you look at um, the amount of s software that is there in the world and again the current model of how we maintain that it's not sustainable or it's very difficult to sustain that model. Because the minute you write a program, it has already become legacy. If you want to change it, you need to go back to the developer community to make changes to it. So maintenance becomes a huge issue. In fact, 70% of the expense today goes into maintaining and supporting the already installed systems. Now, if you look at the brain, there's nobody programming this or reprogramming this. It automatically learns. And hence, again, we need to have new models of computing. You know, we are going to have 50 billion processors floating around with all the sensors and things like that. Imagine 50 billion systems to be maintained across the world. Every one of us will become maintenance engineer for computer. Already we are, because if we are all managing our smartphones. Every other day, we will look at which applications to replace, do we need to upgrade the software, etc., etc., etc. The brain works very differently. Again, can we learn from the brain and come out with better models? So these are some of the reasons from the computer science side. And from the, um, from the people and the society side, uh, one of the areas where we will require further insight, further research is the area of how does the brain age and, and why do some people get Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, dementia, etc. Uh, we are going to become an aging society and um, pretty soon we'll have more than 200 million people who are the above the age of 65. Right now there are about 80 million people who are the above the age of 65. And in a poor society like India, a developing country, a country like India, the cost of supporting people above 65 is going to be huge. And we don't have the 
social security system and the society infrastructure and and this is going to be a huge problem for uh, us as a society and so if we can understand how does the brain age and what can we do to support to prevent to cure uh, and that's the reason why the center for brain research is being set up in bangalore so let me um, close by saying that um, i'm very thankful to um, Dr. Uh, Professor Bhaskar Ramurthy and Professor Nagran because um, they very quickly worked on, um, you know, thought outside the box, uh, come out with um, a person who is ideally suited. Um, I strongly believe that uh, Dr. Partha Mitra will um, make a significant impact um, I wish he will make a significant impact because uh, it would help uh, us here in India to be at the forefront of the next, I believe, next disruption in computing, just as I benefited in the, you know, the previous um, revolution of uh, introducing computers into India. Um, this whole industry came because we were right at the forefront of a developing, evolving, disruptive technology. People like Professor Mahabala ensured that students were trained and we were ready to take advantage of that disruptive technology. And I feel that um, if we want to continue and sustain this, and this is very important for India, three, pl three million plus jobs, $120 billion industry, about $100 billion of exports. This is extremely important for India. And so if we want to sustain this leadership, we must actually be at the forefront and at the cutting edge of this technology. And I strongly feel that um, uh, IIT Madras will be able to be and continue to be at the forefront of this um, through uh, the research that is going to be done and I'm very glad that Dr. Partha Mitra is the first occupant of this chair. Thank you all very much uh, for uh, coming today. Your support um, is very important. Um, it's important from the faculty, from alumni, from the current students, every one of you, because um, you, need to, you need to support such initiatives. And thank you very much for coming today. Thank you. I will now request Chris to hand over a small memento to Professor Mahabla. And now I'll invite Professor Mahabla to say a few words. Dear Professor Nagarajan, Professor Bhaskar Ramurthy, Chris Gopal Krishnan, and uh, Professor Srinivas Kumar. It is nice to be back home. I left IIT in 73 and I um, come back and met the faculty. I enjoyed very much the progress that has been made. When Chris Gopalakrishnan created a distinguished professorships at IIT Madras and indicated that he is interested in brain research, I was a little disturbed because I remember in my high school days, my teachers would often tell me whether I have a brain or mud. I don't know what I really have. Maybe the research that is promoted by Chris will help us find out. It is my association with brain research is very little, except that I know a good friend, Dr. Krishnamurti Srinivas, who works in the VHS in the back of IIT and a very eminent 
neurologist. I used to teach about intelligent automata. We in computer field think that if a set of rules are used to build something, we would call it an automata. And the great von Neumann was the first one to explore the idea that if you had a large number of identical cells interconnected, they could organize themselves and produce intelligence. In fact, I used to assign exercises during my courses in MTech on having coming up with configurations of cells. Of course, you chose what to put into each cell and then prove you can prove that you can even make systems which can self-organize, which can build copy of themselves, thereby reproduced. So it's amazing what a collection of automata can really do. We all enjoy building configurations of such basic cells. And I wish more work in that direction would be done with the support of uh, Chris's generous grant. I recall the first big computer that we got for IIT Madras. It was in a meeting in MHRD, that is the Ministry of Education, that Professor A. Ramachandran was being told that he would be given a grant by Germany and they should get a computer. I told him, very nice, get a research computer. People were flabbergasted. There isn't even a first computer here. And what is this guy asking for a research computer? I was very adamant. I said, look, there are any number of machines to teach programming. But what we want to do is go a step forward. And Germans who were funding that weren't very anxious at the first instance, they said, where will you get experts? Where will you, how will you maintain it? And so on. But we convinced them that where we had the wherewithal. And they finally told Dr. A. Ramachandran, if somebody could, Mahabala could come and run the center, they would give the grant. It was usual for 60% of the grant to be used for visiting faculty and only 40% for buying equipment. But in our case, they said 100% you can spend it on equipment. Ministry gave a matching grant to it and thereby we became the first research computer center in South India. Why in all of India? So it's a prideful place that we have in IIT Madras that we have established a research facility around computer. I remember sometimes the kind of projects we did on the computer. You see, on those days, there weren't anybody who knew programming. Everybody had to be taught Fortran. And how would you do anything worthwhile? Whereas industry was knocking on our doors and saying, hey, you got a computer, why don't we do this? Why don't you help us? So one of those things was, one fine morning, 
one man comes to my house in the campus and says, sir, give me some output. I said, if you want output, go to the computer center. You can pick any number from the waste paper basket. I said, no, sir. We can't submit a tender for a shared audit auditorium unless we produce a computer design of that. I said, okay, do it. But he said, we don't know how to do it. You please help us. And the help turned out to be I had to do it myself. This was repeated over and over again on many early projects. People who had heard of use of computers, they were enthusiastic about it, but they were not yet sufficiently capable in terms of programming a computer. But there was need. BHEL, for example, was going all the way to Singapore to run their design programs. They couldn't afford that to do that many times. So this computer here in IIT Madras created a revolution in industrial use of computers. Myself, Dr. Bhattu Krishnan are very proud of this. And we were the only two programmers, so we had to work night and day to satisfy the anxious customers that we had. One other lady came over from Bombay, said, Sir, I have collected valuable data on education of scheduled caste students. Please process it and uh, give me tables. She had some 32 variables. And I said, which cross table you want? She said, all possible. I said, my lady, that is 18,000 tables and you wouldn't be even be able to look at it, let alone use the result. Then said, you decide. <laughs> Such was the thing, those days people would just come and say, we have heard computers can do it, please put it on the computer. Now put it on the computer, how? Such was then, and I, like my students, my assistants, who made this all possible. They undertook to write programs and generate. One fine morning, I saw about 25 policemen lining up in front of the BSB building. I was worried what we had done that attracted police attention. It turned out that one bright police officer named Krishna Swami thought he would do modus operandi analysis, which is very interesting. It seems criminals specialize. A man who steals saris will not steal jewels because he has contacts, he knows how to get in, when, on what time of day of the week to <coughs> break in and so on. So in some sense, it was a very interesting one and we had to help doing it. This is the kind of a things that we enjoyed. We will all enjoyed doing this. We can't just say, you program it yourself, I will give you computer time. That would help them. So, it was a quite a uphill task to satisfy the interest and curiosity of people who wanted to use this thing called computer. Germans were here and they saw me work with various people and one of those ladies even called me and said, you are Mr. Computer. Such was the fascination about computers. It is somewhat sad now that every kid carries a computer in his pocket, much more powerful than what we thought was mainframe computer. But it's a good progress. We had a lot of fun 
with computer i do tell the young people that have fun with computers in fact i met the faculty of the computer science department and i told them don't just go for very uh, sophisticated theoretical work using computers but just have fun with computers wonder how things can be done by this stupid thing called computer which has no intelligence but yet you can make it behave intelligently so it was a nice journey thanks to the opportunity i got at iit madras that we had fun with computers i hope many more generation of students will have fun with computers because it is through fun something interesting will take place we have said over and over again in many universities is some student spending nights and days in the computer center working on a development of a program that has produced great innovations in computer programming so on this occasion when i got to meet some of my old friends and uh, the generosity of chris gopala krishnan in donating a chair which my grandson thought i would occupy <laughs> i told him no i am not allowed to occupy that chair it is people who are bright and worthy that will be invited to occupy the chairs there will be three such chairs what better way to remember and give guru dakshina than creating of this professorship i salute chris gopala krishnan and i wish thank you all Thanks, Professor Mahabala, for that uh, stroll down memory lane. Um, so, Dr. Partha Mitra of uh, Cold Spring Harbor Lab is the first occupant of the Professor Mahabala chair. We were hoping that he could uh, be with us today via Skype, but uh, something came up at the last minute, and he was not able to join us. However, he has sent us a short uh, video message that we would like to play for you now. start by thanking chris gopala krishnan for establishing the mahabala chair in computational brain research and for the opportunity that this provides me to engage with iit madras students and faculty i want to thank dean professor nagarajan for approaching me and working with me to enable my participation in this chair program um, i also extend my thanks to the institute director professor rama murthy and the head of computer science department professor kumar my felicitations to professor mahabala I would like to talk briefly to you about the opportunities and challenges of brain research. We humans have been wondering for thousands of years about how we think, feel, learn, remember, act and are consciously aware. We have been exhorted to understand ourselves according to the Sanskrit adage atmanam vidhi. Uh, but even after a century of rapid progress in brain research, we are still grappling with fundamental mysteries. and sometimes lack the proper tools to make the relevant measurements and analyze the resulting data more importantly we may be limited by theoretical ideas neurobiology is like chemistry before the periodic table and physics before the laws of gravitation quantum mechanics and electromagnetic radiation we are living at a moment that is an important turning point for the field of brain research there is international excitement about the subject there are coordinated brain research initiatives in the united states the european union and in japan one of the factors causing this pivot is computational technology for example i would like to draw your attention to the amount of computer storage that is required to digitize and store images of whole brains using light microscopy this resolution is required to see individual neurons which are the building blocks of brains consider the laboratory mouse a widely used model organism in neuroscience The brain of a mouse is about 1 cubic centimeter in volume and if imaged using light microscopy produces a few terabytes of data. 
Today in my lab, I have a thousand digitized mouse brains as we try to map its brain circuits. To digitally store one of those brains on hard disk, just 25 years ago, in 1989, would have cost about $30 million, close to the annual budget of IIT Madras today. Needless to say, this research would have been impossible only 25 years ago. However, although we can now acquire and store this data, we still need to analyze and theorize about it, which is where future challenges lie. Computer science has long had a theoretical tie to how brains work. The pioneering mathematician Alan Turing, whose model provides theoretical underpinning to understanding computational complexity, was inspired by arithmetic problem solving by humans and wrote a paper on brains entitled Intelligent Machinery more than half a century ago. In the time that has since passed, computers have become ubiquitous and central to our lives, but the theoretical and scientific uh, questions that motivated Turing and others in thinking about human intelligence remain yet to be fully clarified. Moreover, all the computers seem to be all powerful in important areas, there are big performance gaps between what modern day computing machinery can do and what humans can do. This performance gap may be partially closed in the future by incremental technological advances. However, uh, we really need ways of thinking about the problem that are new, conceptual breakthroughs are needed. One interesting thing about this problem is the relationship between engineering theories and scientific theories. Engineering theories have essentially no role to play in fundamental physics. Rather, engineers use fundamental scientific theories like physics and chemistry to understand the limitations of engineering devices. In an interesting role reversal, in biology, engineering theories like feedback control, uh, communication theory, or the theory of computation have roles to play as part of scientific theorizing. The reason for this is that biological organisms have what biologists call function. Biological organisms have to survive, and in order to do so, have to solve problems, much like engineers have to design solutions to the problems of human survival. In biology, there is no engineer, but there is the natural process of evolution, which in some ways acts like an engineer, acting by trial and error, but at the end of the day, coming up with a solution to the problem at hand. In doing so, biological organisms have to obey the same constraints and laws that human engineers have to obey. Some of these constraints come from the laws of physics, but there are also fundamental engineering constraints that tell us about the intrinsic difficulties of solving problems. These engineering constraints, such as the computational complexity of solving algorithmic problems, can be studied using mathematics, uh, but do not directly appear in physical theory. We can expect that they will become a more important part of future theory of biology and of brain function. In other words, there are deep links between engineering and science that we need to exploit in understanding how brains work. Uh, thank you for your attention, and I look forward to our future interactions in this exciting area of uh, science, medicine, and technology. I now invite Professor Srinivas Kumar, head of the Department of uh, Computer Science and Engineering, to address the audience. Good evening to all of you. Uh, Sri uh, Chris Gopalakrishnan, uh, co-founder uh, of the largest multinational IT companies of India, the Infosys, and a very distinguished alumnus of uh, IIT Madras and the Department of Computer Science and Engineering, has been a very generous uh, donor to uh, IIT Madras. On behalf of the uh, uh, Computer Science and Engineering Department, I heartily welcome the, his endowment of, and uh, setting up his uh, uh, chair uh, uh, professor positions in the area of uh, computational brain research and neuro, neuromorphic uh, computing in IIT Madras. Uh, the, the amazing uh, capabilities of our uh, human brains continue to intrigue us and then uh, also inspire us uh, for uh, continuing research in several fields including uh, computer science. In spite of the several advances that uh, computer science and, and allied fields have done, the uh, performance of the current day uh, computers on, uh, on the tasks that are similar to our uh, human cognitive activities are really no match uh, to the capabilities of our own brains. 
it's indeed amazing that you know our uh, human brains can carry out uh, these cognitive functions uh, in a in a very uh, effortless uh, manner and that too at a uh, at a low uh, you know using very low power that's that's an amazing uh, thing so so certainly we need to understand a lot more about our own uh, brains in order to make further advances in our efforts to make computers better at uh, human uh, like human like cognitive functions of course this knowledge uh, about our own uh, brains and their architecture how they function also going to contribute uh, contribute you know uh, to better uh, the uh, to better understand the various uh, problems uh, that uh, fellow human uh, uh, men are having with uh, brain uh, disorders for example so needless to say uh, experts from various uh, disciplines uh, electronics and vlsi computer science neuroscience medicine and probably several others uh, need to take part in this effort to unravel the mysteries of the human brain so it's in this context uh, 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 several international efforts are underway for example the uh, the human brain project of the european commission uh, and the brain activity map project of the uh, us government so the the timely move by uh, sri chris kopalakrishnan of institution of this uh, chair professor positions in itm would surely enable itm to develop the Uh, and nurture this research areas in this interesting and important areas it will enable us uh, in the itm to bring world class researchers uh, in this area uh, to work in iit madras and uh, faculty members of the computer science and engineering department and allied colleagues from allied departments are uh, looking forward to utilizing these uh, opportunities that are set up and uh, having a uh, fruitful interactions with this uh, chair professors so it's a it's a great beginning that a world class researcher uh, dr partha mitra uh, has been chosen to be the first chair professor and uh, it is this partnership that we are looking forward to and earnestly hoping uh, that it would result in very interesting uh, research advances in the in this computational brain research finally it's very gratifying that sri chris kopalakrishnan has chosen to name the chair professor positions after the former professors of the csc department who have laid the strong foundation for the future growth of our department thank you very much sir thank you all for your attention i want to thank professor mahabala and his um, his family and so many friends for joining us on this occasion i want to thank uh, chris for endowing this chair i want to thank professor baskar and professor srinivas kumar for enabling the, the rapid implementation of this chair and i want to thank all of you for coming here and honoring professor mahabala and chris on this occasion so thank you all for coming and have a safe journey home